An Advanced Psychology of the East, a lecture by Idris Shah delivered in 1977 before a live audience. Once upon a time, there was a Sufi who possessed a really enormous range of teaching stories and of accounts of the doings and sayings of the classical masters and of the knowledge of how and when these elements were to be applied in the learning situation to provide the real psychological effects which, as you know, otherwise run away into the sand. I'm talking now of our position that teaching materials of a literary sort are less didactic or descriptive than they are instrumental. This is something which I repeat quite a lot because lots of people still don't believe it, as it were. These are designed just as much to provoke thought, action, understanding as they are to entertain or to bewilder even. Now, on the basis of the learning by contact theory, this teacher always allowed a certain number of his less able pupils to attend his seminars. So normally, you see, you would say, look, you can't learn very much, uh, you better not come to my seminar or whatever. But he thought, well, we've got a kind of way in which some will learn and others might be able to learn from those who've half learned sort of thing. He was able to teach in this way. And that's how it happened that he got into his school somebody whose understanding was extremely faulty. And this chap always asked irrelevant questions. And when people were set a tale to study, say he uh, studied the wrong one, and all that kind of thing. So at long last, very reluctantly, this Sufi teacher told this man, he must go. Terribly sorry, you must go. Not because he couldn't learn so much, but because of the adherence to the principle expressed in the ancient Persian saying, the presence of a dog does not improve a pool of rose water. He was getting in the way, in other words, and other people were learning from him how to behave in that particular way. Now, the student was naturally rather depressed, upset, but ultimately realizing that his teacher or the teacher wouldn't change his mind, he packed his few belongings and went on his way. Two or three years later, this same Sufi was sitting at the entrance to his home when a magnificent, chauffeur-driven, custom-built, limousine, gold-plated, upholstered in Persian carpets, silk, swept up to him, out jumped the unsuccessful student. His hand outstretched, beaming joyously at the sight of his old master. Oh, I'm glad to see that you've been successful in the world, said his master. Am I to take it that you've at last given up the desire to learn from the teaching stories? Oh, yes. I took her advice to heart. You know, instead of studying them, I teach them now. <laughs> Now, this is a very old story, but we're supposed to be talking about the relevance of what we try to communicate to concerns of the present day. And it's interesting to note that there's more than just an analogical connection with that kind of history being played out in the world at this very moment. It happens again and again. I mean, you even say something like, those who can do and those who can't teach us. Well. That's what that story is, really. Now, the same sort of pattern, the pattern of misuse of the materials, trivialization, using at a lower level, theologizing and so on, is seen in the individual who imagines that he can teach himself, or who, of course, imagines he can be taught by somebody of his choice, as it were. This person of his choice might just be the man in this gold-plated limousine, you see, be careful. Now, people read stories and they ransack books for Sufi exercises and psychological or spiritual techniques, and then, remarkably often, to our way of thinking, to my way of thinking, shall we say, they set about trying to employ these things. Well, of course, it does surprise us because if I were to find a textbook on surgery, I wouldn't try to take out my own appendix just because I'd read it and there were diagrams. I don't pretend to know why people who wouldn't take out their own appendix will attempt even more extensive tampering with themselves such as I have referred to now. Imitation may be the sincerest form of flattery, but who wants to be imitated by seeing somebody in the process ruining himself? I mean, it's hardly, somehow it seems even more convoluted than we need to have in, even in this subject. So this is the exact reason why the progress, as it's called, of a student uh, in the Sufi area is very carefully monitored by what you call feedback, how he's taking it, how he understands it, where he is, what should be done with, to, or for him. 
And I really can't overemphasize this. This using materials with a developmental function in an improper manner is almost exactly paralleled by the accounts of people who want to get thinner but eat such large quantities of special slimming foods that they ingest even more calories than before and, and get fatter. This actually does happen. So therefore, we may here have rather a common human principle disguised, I mean, people say greed or something, something like that, disguised by the, the rationalizations. Well, why shouldn't I teach myself? After all, I, you can teach yourself everything else, or these people are just pretending that they can teach. We're extremely interested in what you would call the ordinary psychological behavior of people. Just as much as we are in their spiritual potential, we're interested in their greed for this reason. We're interested in People complain bitterly about this, I and mean, the negative things about people as well as the positive. People say, give me something. They don't say, liberate me from something, because they don't realize they need liberating or something like that. And so it's very often difficult to do business with such people, and hence the aphorisms that people do not really want to learn. Well, I don't believe that they don't want to learn. I believe that the explanations haven't really been given. We don't believe, for instance, that you can graft on top of greed religion, although most people do. They think if you are greedy for truth or God or something, then it isn't greed in some alchemical manner. We are unable to understand that posture, luckily. Now, many of the Sufi concepts and practices which we have observed to possess the most useful and thorough effects on people, as I'm using that particular way of talking, are ones which do not automatically fit in with various major Western preoccupations. This does not mean that Western people cannot embody them into their traditions or their ways, but or that they're totally absent from the culture, far from it. In fact, I have seen and continue to see the transition affected supremely well. But it does involve the addition of a dimension which we can call flexibility. If you want a little example of the cross-purposes situation which can occur when people from one culture meet those of another, I'll tell you a little incident which I observed when people who want love and attention think that they don't and that they think there's some other motivation for a contact. That's not aimed at you particularly, but we do have a lot of societies now in the world whose people have grown up with a great hankering for love and attention. And anybody who says enough love is enough, too little is criminal, but too much is also criminal. If anybody says that, they get rather nervous. And Shuffle, I'm sure there isn't anybody like that here, but I'll go on with the story. So I was sitting once with a Sufi when a foreign visitor dressed in the standard foreign spiritual seeker's garb that we have come to know and love so well came roaring in and he says to this chap, why don't you, why don't you see me more often, master? You see, and this fellow just looked at him and looked kind of weary and said, because I'm trying to teach you, not entertain you. And he was quite right, but you probably couldn't get away with that here. You couldn't get away with saying that here. So there is a slight difficulty. First, you've got to teach the person to whom you're talking that you are not, you're not hostile, and that this is one way in which he can learn. But his difficulty is adopting a posture towards you, or towards the learning materials and situation, which is not what you would probably call paranoid, suspicious, ultra-suspicious. You can often only do that by living in the village, the national or global village, as they call it, the national village, where these people are. I mean, when I moved into my little village where I'm living in England part of the time, bricks came through the windows. That was the real village reaction. Bricks came through the windows at first. Then bricks stopped coming through the windows, and now we have complete reversal of symptom, paradoxical reversal of symptoms, I think you call it, in which um, oh, there's a new hospital built, and my wife has to go and open it because she <laughs> well, of course, I, I did read a, a paper that somebody wrote discovering that people whom you have formerly disliked, when they become your friend, they become a better friend than somebody you have, you have liked all along. This is a bit of sociological work, so perhaps my best course is uh, quite obvious as to what I should do. <laughs> However, I can't help complaining because I don't say that I exactly want your love and attention, but I don't really want to be disliked. And uh, if that's the only way to make friends, I'm going to have to think about it a little bit more first, so I'm not committing myself here. But anyway, such material as I have been giving you is designed for several purposes. 
Now I'm going to interrupt myself. I'm going to say that the first process that I want to introduce you to is that in a situation where you have perhaps read, many of you, some of you, I don't know how many, uh, some Sufi material which has been published for the purpose of its being read by the public and others, when you've read this, you get a certain quantity of nutrition, stimulus, interest, and so on out of that. You may think it's a great secret, or so you may think it's trivial, or whatever you like, you get something out of it. Now, you need a further stimulus or input of information or something, we call it an impact, in order to get more out of that information. So you don't have to do the Mullah Nasruddin thing when he said, I have nothing to do, and this chap says, why don't you go read a book? And he said, read a book, I tried that once. In a, you, know, a, you, you must regard the books as all legitimate, traditional, psychological, uh, psycho-spiritual materials as a reservoir of materials which enrich your experience successively in accordance with what you learn as you go along in life. Normally this process takes a very long time and we are old and grey and dead before it happens and that's why old people are supposed to be wise. Well, as I've said before, if you have to invent the alphabet each time for yourself, so you're going to be nearly dead before you can actually read a book. Well, here we are with this material which has been similarly collected in order to telescope human experience. And human experience does tend to go along that way. You read something, see something, learn something, say, uh, time passes, for it for you to digest it, then something else happens which stimulates that material or your experience of it and you become wiser or more skilled and so on. Now this is the process which our material does therefore. If things which I say in, under these circumstances uh, register with you and you have the patience then remember the books we've published particularly with stories and teaching encounters are designed to yield further materials. So this is a halfway house between simply reading about something in an instruction manual and studying it in a more intensive course. So I hope you'll be able to get more after hearing, whether you remember it consciously or not, what I have been trying to do. Luckily, it is coming about apparently where I and others associated with me are going to be able at last to find the sort of associates in this culture who are in the educational area and who can and do do part of the job which we formerly had to do. You might call it a non-spiritual job, sociological or information and orientation job. That kind of thing had to be done by the Sufi teacher. He had to do various things which we are able to do or can be done for you now by means of an institution such as a university. So what I am interested in is the naturalization into this culture of certain concepts which have been neglected in this culture. So you can't build on, on them. You can't build psychologically, spiritually, and so on, on something which isn't there. As you say, for example, in the case of a spiritual thing, if you think that emotional overrunning of the brain and of the adrenaline is the same as spirituality, then you can't find spirituality until you're able to carry on the real human traditional function of splitting one thing off another, subdividing one from another so that you can work with each separately or both together. This is something which you have to do if you are interested in that side of things. So this naturalization is difficult, but it should be remembered. Somebody, I, in a book I was reading in yesterday, is rather grumpily saying, uh, those of us who are going on about carrying on about Sufis in these days, keep on saying how long we've been at it and how uh, long it took to get it established in people's minds. But why do we do that? Well, I'll tell you why. Because we have the exact dating of the fact that it took five centuries to establish acceptance of the Sufis as a legitimate branch of human thought in the Middle East. It took us five centuries. That's why we say it, partly to remind ourselves and partly to let you keep your hearts up because we are at least tolerated here in much less than five centuries. And here you have a room full of people willing to listen to, uh, I have perhaps from politeness, but anyway, at least uh, I could uh, be allowed to hazard the uh, guess that they might even be interested and certainly not all that hostile. Well, this is uh, less than five centuries. So we're ahead of the game. The integration of this way of thinking, which has its own symmetry, by the way, there is a component there which I haven't mentioned, is the ability to think and work along lines which are, I'm afraid, established by the teaching itself. You can't necessarily possess yourself of the tools, thinking tools, such as we are 
uh, pointing out and employ them to zap yourself into higher consciousness or whatever. You may try it, but we don't think you can. But I say the ability. No, I say the ability and not the compulsion, which is another thing, another very important thing to remember. Uh, you may have gained the impression that some of us rather run down the, the Far Eastern thinkers a bit too much, but that isn't the intention. But these people, people in the Far East do tend to have it right when they distinguish between compulsion and patience, as it were. We look for students who learn because they want to, not because they can't do anything else. The society here so far hasn't supported us very well in that. It has specialized in inculcating the compulsion. I've got to learn, I've got to teach, I've got to, you see? Now, learners under a compulsion to learn are, in our terms, poor learners, we believe. Teachers cannot teach by imposing anything. There are famous sayings which people have meditated for years on this very point. There is a, one famous historical Sufi, Maruf Karhi, in the ninth century, a disciple of one of my own ancestors, Imam Raza, and he said, a Sufi has a right to be served, but he has no right to demand. Now this applies to the teacher-pupil situation. It is the Sufi teacher's role to give as much as he can and take as little as he can. It is the learner's role to respect, as it were, the teacher to the extent to which the communication is possible. Not more, not less. Don't wash his feet, don't throw yourself at his feet, don't call him master or any but. A certain amount of harmonization is necessary before communication to, can take place. Now, in your culture here, the things which you learn, you learn because you have a good relationship with your teacher. He makes you laugh, or he's a regular guy, or he's mm, whatever it is. You have a good relationship with him. I can learn from that fellow. He helps me learn, or learn from him or through him. Similarly, we have the same sort of thing. Now, this is what you might call a rapport. It is not a dependency situation. But people very often mistake it for that, and the deterioration of this is the dependency situation, and it happens very often in the East, and it has been imported together with it, like the Colorado beetle which eats potatoes. I don't know what you call it here, but was imported into England, but it came with the potatoes. They didn't want it. Well, this is what happens with uh, Oriental philosophy, too. So there's this question of compulsion. And it was in this connection, a thousand years later, that my great-great-grandfather said, somebody wrote it down, if you want to be owned by a tyrant, then accept someone who only imagines he is a student. Because what he'll do is he'll get mileage out of the relationship, you see. He'll <laughs> make you worry about him, he'll make you serve him, as it were. Which isn't the same as you're serving him because you have to, it's you, you're serving him because you've, you've chosen the wrong student. Now, these sort of things are technical requirements. These are among the requirements. They're just as important as standing on your head and repeating things thousands of times, if not more important. Now, here we have, quite definitely, two kinds of teacher. The ordinary familiar type who feels a need to teach, which is referred to, I think, here as a vocation, for some reason I haven't been able to fathom, although people have tried to explain it. A calling. Very good. The second kind is the Sufi teacher, who comes into being after he has initially had a far greater thirst to learn. And when this thirst is assuaged, he is then in a position to say whether he should be a teacher or not, or could be. Many, many Sufis are not teachers. And there are another series of people who, who act on behalf of Sufi teachers, are very often revered as Sufi teachers, especially because they tend to get to like the role, who act as deputies for these people. But uh, unluckily, in most cultures, probably including the Western one, people aren't able to distinguish. Somebody who is in a position of authority over them is regarded either as a friend or an enemy. He can't be regarded as a channel, an instrument, as a um, conductor of something. This is, again, the lingering barbarism in advanced societies. One thing hasn't been detached from another. Now, this may sound subtle to people not accustomed to it, but in practice it becomes completely clear. Unluckily, it's like living in the village. In order to make this clear, you have to get yourself, or whoever is doing it, known to the people with whom you're working, so they can tell the difference between the pocket Napoleon, who may be the Sufi teacher's intermediary, and the Sufi teacher and the Sufi phenomenon, because the Pocky Napoleon is, people would say, oh, but he must be a realized man before he can do anything. Well, how realized does a hammer and chisel have to be? I'm talking about function, 
and try to remember there is a difference between function and woozy thought. I mean, I don't claim to be a great sequential thinker, but I can tell the difference. I'm inviting you to join me in this. Oh, incidentally, before I came, this is positively my last attack on Western people. Uh, so I'll tell you that this is that I'm just going to say, but before I came to the West, which I admit is Europe, uh, in my mind, and not here, which is rather more of the West, truly, I was told all sorts of things about the people in the West. You know? They are lucid. They are logical. They are efficient. They know one thing from another. Watch it, my boy. Don't ever mistake one thing from another. So I learned that because I was motivated. I'm going West. I'm going to learn these things. They're not going to be any better than I am. I will hopefully be as good as they are at telling one thing or another. Here I am, all dressed up and nowhere to go. I land in, uh, where was it, Geneva or somewhere, and I have, well, I'm still looking for these people. I don't think they've come into being yet. What has happened is they have learned to subdivide. They've learned to tear the legs and wings off the fly and then say, what happened to the fly? They're in the famous scientific experiment of which you may have heard, people use that to knock scientists, of course. They have learned to subdivide things which they know how to subdivide, and I've often been guilty of expressing myself rather freely in this way. Like, for instance, as I often say, I'm now well known for about two things, one of which is for screaming out, people come to my house and take away ashtrays, but they never leave their wallets behind by mistake. Doesn't that <laughs> seem to indicate something, you see? But it, it, it can get a laugh, but it, uh, it doesn't seem to indicate anything to people because it is part of their experience that they take ashtrays but don't leave their wallets. They don't think that there can be any reason for it. The only person who's ever dealt with this, and that wasn't a very great length, was Dr. Freud, who said, if you leave your wallet behind, it means you secretly want to come back and retrieve it. So, well, all right. The second thing which is required in order to learn what we are trying to convey is the avoidance without hypocrisy of outward show and not to demand more immediate satisfactions than necessary from involvement in this enterprise. That's a very difficult thing to establish because people generally think there's a kind of what they call in England perks. I think it's what you call fringe benefits here that I'm a Sufi, so I better look like a Sufi. You say, I get that for free, or else it makes me holy. Say, now, this is some kind of rationalization business that is not only repulsive in appearance, but counterproductive in action. So we are committed to making quite clear that you can have one of two things. You can have the appearance, as it were, of sanctity or the sanctity itself. You may choose whichever you like. But they are important. And, of course, it must be familiar to you in, in other situations. For example, if you're going to the movies and you want to watch the movie, you go in, you sit down, you pay your money, you sit down, there's the movie. Well, if you jump up and I shout, hurrah, I'm at the movies, look at me, look at me, here's the movies, I'm at the movies. You won't see the movies, don't you understand? I don't suppose. You might be spiritually better in doubt and be able to do that as well, but then, in that case, you wouldn't be listening to me, perhaps. So, there is that. Now, you must learn the flexibility of attitude. For example, if you're living in a society where you have to say, like somebody said to me, or I think lots of people have, how do you do, or pleased to meet you, I reckon you're sincere, and I'm sincere too, and I'm so sincere that when I say I'm being sincere, I'm really feeling with every fiber of my being that I'm sincere, and there's something about this sincerity which is so sincere, and so Well, if you've got, that's the substitute, according to us, for sincerity. I, Hope it's, uh, according to you too, the substitute for it. That's a grotesque of it. Something nearly like that has happened to me more than once. But there is more than a residue, a disabling residue of this posturing in the societies with which I am dealing. And they're not always the Western one. So it's a question of taking more out of the situation than you should in, in terms of hypocrisy, emotionality, and so on. Now, if you live in a neighborhood or live among a people where you've got to sing for your supper, jump up and down and say, hi, Hank, I'm so sincere this morning. How are you? Have a sincere day. And he said, oh, yeah, you have a sincere day. All right, that's what you have to pay for living in that society. But don't start to believe it. Don't let it turn you on. Don't let it make you feel good, you know. We all have to do things we don't want to do or like to do or do not consider to be real. If you want to start to think that that is real, 
oh, gee, I'm real, and when I feel I'm real and say I'm real, I'm so real, I couldn't be any realer than I... People actually exist like that, and I've had more than my fair share of them, and I'm quite willing to admit that it is abnormal uh, because of my peculiar position as having obtained a reputation of guruism or something, so a lot of nuts come to see me, and they think this is the way you do it. You say, I admit that, uh, because when on previous occasions I have charged people with this, I have almost universally been told, oh, that's not typical. They're not typical. And I say, but what's, what about you? Oh, I'm not typical. I say, well, look, I met an American once. Oh, no, but the ones you meet outside. Have you ever been to the States? No. How old are you? I'm 52 years old. Well, you better go then, because they're quite different there. Well, luckily, I have something to tell you, ladies and gentlemen. I never believed that, but I have discovered they are quite different here, and they're much, much better. And uh, it's very, very lucky for me, <laughs> and I'm still reveling in it, but... I'm talking not about the grotesques. I'm talking about the residual hypocrisy, self-deception, and other terrible things which prevent one from learning because one is performing, as it were. And not everybody can learn and perform any more than many people can teach and perform. Although teaching is nearer to performing than learning is. Now, this may all sound terrible, don't do this, don't do that, don't do the other, but it isn't my fault. I mean, if somebody's got a metal bolt through his neck or something, and you say, why, or take it away or something, it isn't, <laughs> although, I mean, it's simply uh, an honest question. Why have you got a metal bolt through your neck? Or, or not, it doesn't mean, if he's paranoid enough to say, why do you single me out, or why are you picking on that particular thing? Well, you must have an answer, and my answer is, I don't think you need this metal <laughs> bolt through your neck, and I think it's hampering you. Now, one has a certain difficulty here because I can't say, you know, Jubilation T. Cornpone, the famous mystic and saint of Los Burros, California, go and see him, and there is a true realized man, be like him, you see, because so far we haven't tracked one down. The moment we do, I'll be able to get onto other subjects. So in other words, we don't have whatever you might call it, a paradigm or something to point out. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It may just mean that they don't have the kind of visibility which we would need in order to point them out to you, say. So hopefully that will occur, or come into being sooner or later. At the moment, we cannot allude, except in passing, to the situation in many countries of the East where I could say to you, I would like you to go and see such and such a person, and you'll see that person's got some of the things that we call sanctity, which we call by difficult words which don't translate very well, like got transparency. I mean, that actually means a person who has in some way been refined, not in the worst sense of the word, in refined uh, is a product of what I'm trying to talk about. It's rather difficult to explain it, but it can often be, as someone they sometimes say, has baraka. What is baraka? Baraka is some impalpable thing, some, you know, you say charisma. You say charisma for people who get you to vote this way or that, you know. Well, this is one of those things which it is difficult to explain because it isn't locally available. But I think myself that this is one of the six and half a dozen situations. That is, in some ways, in this culture, we've got infinitely better communication abilities, capabilities, capacities, whatever the word is in various branches of English, potential. But then, on the other side of the ledger, we have the problem that we don't have the exemplar, really. So we just have to work in accordance with possibilities. We must adjust our communication accordingly. But I can't help lamenting that such people aren't uh, numerous enough to be able to carry out our little pilgrimages to them, as it were, or observe them in action so that we could learn from them, learn about them, see that there are such people. It is, it is a bit difficult in this culture. Another thing which has to be learnt, you can learn it, lots of you can do it, but isn't really at a premium in this society is the ability to act or not act in accordance with what one knows by experience to be a required mode of action. Not to be so much a prisoner of conditioning, reflexive actions, things which one, I simply got to do, they say such and such a thing. I've simply got to do this. I, sim uh, I don't know why it is, or I do know why it is, and I simply got to do that. If I don't go to the ball game, I get so sore or something like that. Well, okay, but you are a ball game fanatic or something, right, nothing wrong with it. You're, that's probably the best possible thing you could or should be. 
But unfortunately, we meet these kind of people uh, who are also trying for everything else, including the Sufi message, the higher consciousness, this and that. So one has to point out that every form of learning has its own requirements, and you may have to give up a lot of your automatism in order to reacquire volitional action. And a lot of this volitional capacity is needed in studying in our area. All right, it's another difficult thing to do. It's the condition of doing something or doing nothing, not because it's expected of you or because you can't help doing anything else, but because you perceive some value in doing that. And that value isn't necessarily postponed satisfactions, money, excitement, and so on. The value, well, I suppose you might call it some kind of a subliminal ESP. In other words, in certain situations, you begin to see, this is not the same as being inspired by spirits and doing crazy things, because you don't start doing that, and one might say so, but it is that you begin to detect in the environment situations where an intervention by you will have a certain effect, probably for your own good, probably in order to increase that very capacity. Now this is something which one needs to develop to a small degree for this learning process. It's equivalent to being perceptive. It isn't an end in itself, it's an instrument. And when you get beyond that, of course, you lose this ESP capacity, something which is scandalous and horrible to say, in, I'm sure, in California, of all places, that this capacity is counterproductive, the kind of capacity which most people are looking for to be able to see through walls or know what to do and things like that. It is counterproductive. However, I must delineate to you the facts as we know them, or as we purport to know them. I've already said, now, the other thing is that uh, the superficial appearance is the identifying garb, for example. The way it's come over here is people wear funny clothes and they call themselves this isn't that. In Sufi tradition and continuously published literature, we see that uh, there are hundreds of passages where it is plainly explained that people put on uniform garb in our tradition, our convention is that I put on the same robe as somebody else, or I'm given it, the same clothes, because I am a sheep. It's a signal that I wish to cease to be a sheep, and the moment I become a human being, I no longer wear it. And so, I have many quotations, like from the Irshadat of Sheikh Ibrahim, a famous 17th century Sufi, when he says, the teacher gives up outward appearances in favor of inward reality. In fact, you can't really have both. The seeker at first adopts robes and a rosary, and then as he progresses, he gives up ceremonialism because he has understanding. So this is very different from the life of our dear queen, as we say in England. Very different from how you would think it to be. I don't want to help in this process of the export of superficialities. But it is true that externals are extremely important, external behavior, but they usually mean the very reverse of what you have been led to believe they mean. They tell me in New York, schmaltz means what I'm trying to say by what we are again against. But on the other hand, we are not against human service. Our whole philosophy is based on that, and this is in part because human service is not only generally considered to be a good thing, but that it is instrumentally valuable. That's to say, whether or not you go to heaven for helping your fellow creature, you will certainly benefit by transferring some of your attention off yourself and spreading the load a bit onto somebody. If you're thinking about yourself all the time, you won't be able to think about anything else. If you think about yourself and somebody else, then you will become a little more sophisticated, a little able to think of other things. And so, it's a counsel of the uh, highest form of selfishness is altruism. This is something which we are very keen on, but people tend to say, they're so good, these people, you know, they go about doing things like uh, orphanages and so on. Well, it is a form of selfishness. It's, it's instrumental. We are not anxious to feel sensation of reward, if say, oh, I feel so good because I did such a good thing, or somebody says, you did such a good thing, and say, oh, no, it's all right, I didn't really. We want to neutralize this cheap kicks. You know, I give a dollar, and I get a hundred dollars worth of sentimental reward for it, and I get heaven as well as the other end. That's something which has to be brought into some kind of balance. Now, the Sufis have always tried to do this, always. 
and they are still trying to do it, and they are doing it successfully here and there. Now, we have here another thing. I'm trying to give you a little idea of various things which you will find represented in a lot of these stories and other materials which we have published. They may not connect in your mind at this moment, but you'll find if you read it, you'll see things will stick. Following on the idea of human service, people don't see the real um, or the functional component, ingredient of human service because they're too anxious to get reward or punishment out of human service on not doing it. We are left to pick up the pieces and tell you about it. Now there's another thing that I want to emphasize and that is the analogy. There is an analogy of people not being able to perceive, not perceiving in ordinary life things which will help them mature themselves or develop themselves. Something which I just referred to, that you will develop, you should be able to develop a sense of this. What you should do and what you shouldn't do. Not just as a value-loaded system, this is bad, I mustn't do it, but this is neither good nor bad, nor might I even have ever noticed it before, but it is useful to me. So the, the best way to look on this is some sort of electronic emanation thing. Vibes come off, if good vibes come off this, so I'll do it. Good vibes mean something which enables me to expand my consciousness, my knowledge, my whatever phrase you happen to be using at the moment. It's the same thing. And to us, this is one of the conditions of humanity. We go about, we see people, they're living a certain kind of life, and this life is good, shall we call it. They live under a benign system, they pay their way, they don't beat their wives, or their wives don't beat their husbands, or whatever it is. Now, there are social critics, people who say, this is wrong, we must do this or that. There are even social critics who will ask questions from anybody about anything, try to get everything politicized, as it were. Like somebody was asking me in New York when I was here before, you know, what's your position on whatever it is? Bussing, bussing, which I'd never heard before. You say, well, here's the fellow who paid $45, $50 or something to listen to a symposium about, I don't know what, but all he wanted was something about bussing. He didn't realize that I am the, the last person. He'd get no value for his dollars out of our, you know, coming in and asking me about bussing. He's wasted his money, hasn't he? I mean, an expert on bussing, or an enemy of bussing, or a friend of bussing, whatever that is, would have been better value for him, or a demonstration for or against bussing. But here is an example of a person starving in the midst of plenty, as it were. He is a member of the 20th century clean, hygienic, democratic civilization, but doesn't know what's happening to his dollars <laughs> and desperately needs to know about busing. Can't wait until the evening when somebody in a bar will tell him or something. Now, this is very difficult. And when you talk to such people, you are able to find they're quite intelligent, quite interesting. You have good jobs. Some are bank managers even. Very amazing. <laughs> See? So something is, if not wrong, something is funny. So as you go about, you see this funny thing. Now that's the extreme example of it. I tell you that because I share it with you. So you, you too would say there's some kind of a nut or something. Now, there's another thing. There's another pattern as we scan this community, this society. We see that it is starving in the midst of plenty because it doesn't have a lot of what's probably roughly instinctive nous. It cannot actually tell. The people can't actually tell what course they should adopt. Shall I go to the movies or shall I go to the ball game? So they've got no idea. They have no feel for it. In fact, if you said to them even, well, you know, it might be better to go to the ball game because you will learn more there, analogically, which will help something in your brain or something, they're likely to get too interested in what you're saying. I mean, this sounds kind of weird or fantastic, or my God, or something like that, and you aren't going to be able to teach them, so you may have to steer them to the ball game. But I would like to establish this principle. I, say, I don't say believe in it, but I say this is one of the things which can be done by people in any society. They can learn more by knowing what experiential choices to make. And most people may think this is some kind of a metaphysical thing, or you know, people say, well, I've got to have my own experiences, you know. I've got to commit suicide, I won't let you do it for me because I've got to have it for real. You know, that's where that one ends up. But um, there is such a thing as a choice of choices. Something which may sound a bit strange to you, especially when I don't put it very high. I say it's a very ordinary thing. But this is something worth putting into one's mind. Now, the analogy, rather like the man and the busing, we have a story about it because that doesn't happen only in this civilization. There's a very old story about it. And I'll tell you this. There was a king, you see, and he was listening to a lecture about Sufi things. And like many of you here is feeling fed up and tired, you know, it's all very well these people who stand up and tell you what to do, you know. He was thinking, look, I'm a king, I mean, I don't have to take all this kind of stuff. I hope many of you feel exactly the same way, because it is useful. 
much better than the other way. And besides, according to that, sociological research will become better friends. If you, the sooner you hate me, the sooner I'll be able to become friends with you later. But that was interrupting. So this fellow says for the thousandth time, as this poor old king seemed to this king, as coming and going half asleep inside this eyes, uh, uh, Sufi is saying to him, hundreds are blind, and even those who are not blind cannot understand what they see. So he was rather more of a fire eater than I am. And he held his hand up. Now the king said, now look, I'm the king of this country, and I'm now going to stop you and ask you to match allegation with demonstration. On pain of death, show me these people who are blind and those who are not blind, but still will not understand what they see. Is that perfectly ordinary? All right, said the Sufi. All right, I, in fact, I, um, I'm going to do it. I was going to do it anyway, and I will give you the honor of participation in this. So the king said, all right, what do I have to do? Do I have to take off my crown and robes. He said, oh, no, no, on the contrary, you have to put on your, keep your crown and robes and come with me to the marketplace. So they go down to the marketplace, the king with his robes and crown and this sort of whoever he is, this Sufi fellow. And so he says, right. Sufi leads him to a copper beater's shop. And he says, now I want you to sit here and beat copper all day. But he said, my crown and robe, yes, he said. And he says, not only will you beat copper, but you'll hammer the same bit of copper all day. So the king sat there all day. Sufi sat beside him with a pen and paper. And every few minutes, somebody stopped and looked at the king beating the, <laughs> the copper and said, What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't you? <laughs> so at the end of the day, the king was too far gone to know what was happening. And he said, Well, what happened, you see? So the Sufi said to him, Well, here's the list of all the people who were so blind, they couldn't see what you were doing. Although they could see, but they had to ask. So the king thought, yeah, well, all right, that's all right, yeah, that's good. Um, but he said, but he said, look, I mean, you said there was a list of the people who are not blind but still can't understand what they see. He said, well, it's the same list, <laughs> the same list of people. So one must say something like this, that you know the story of the emperor's new clothes and the child in the crowd and so on. I really believe that it's partly due to ad mass, what, uh, the media. Too many of us thinking too often about the same sort of things only, the same range of things, including way out things until higher consciousness or ESP becomes, as it were, sloganized. It's this contraction of our range of input of concepts that has made us so that I wouldn't mind betting $10 that if we had the child in the crowd situation again and the emperor had no clothes, that if the, if the child cried out, the emperor has no clothes on, almost everyone would hush him as emperors come and shh, and then they'd send him for psychoanalysis as disturbed. Very possible. So we must be aware of this. And that's why I'm all for, for one, I'm all for saying and doing things which may not have any uh, special relevance to uh, spiritual paths or something, just to keep that particular shop open, that particular door open, variety. Because we are living in this rather plastic society. And it's no particular salvation of it to refuse to eat plastic things and to instead eat organic. Instead of eating 17 plastics, we eat 17 organics. Well, you may be healthier, but you're still pretty attenuated in your intake. Ability to switch attention is the other thing. One reason why I tell what was supposed to be jokes, and there were lots of people are very kind enough to laugh at them, is that this is to try and switch attention to some extent. That's why I do silly things like this is the sound of one hand clapping. Now, this is to switch your attention. It's not just to wake you up, although I'm very sympathetic with those, relatively many of you, who are on the point of going to sleep, because it's partly the time, and partly I've eaten too much lunch. But we must soldier on. So switching of attention is very important. Now, we call this awareness of reality, or something equivalent to that. You know how the people talk about, what is the roseness of a rose? Things like that. Okay, I have no fault to find with people who say, what is the roseness of a rose? Or people who say, it's the roseness of the rose which counts. Now, in our experience, it isn't really the roseness of the rose. It is that that concept is designed not to baffle you, actually make you switch off or to get higher consciousness, but in order to make you more aware of something, like a rose, just get more aware of it. But as soon as you begin to say, what does this rose mean? And I want to know. And then it's, it's discharged its optimum function. It's now getting troublesome to you. But uh, whole cults have been based on what does that rose really mean. So I want to restore the short-term instrumental function of these things. And this awareness of reality is one of them. That means that however much you want to get out of the world, or however much you want to get on in the world, you 
ought to be able to look at, perceive, take in, become aware of things around you, like a rose, a chandelier, or a mess of corn bone, anything you like, afresh. For instance, you look at an automobile, there are various ways of looking at it. One way is, what's that thing with four wheels, which he pronounced, quite rightly, inefficient. And the other one is, you know, if you're crossing the road, it doesn't have to be an automobile. You know by the outline it's going to run you down or something like that, so you get away. But there's something in between. There is, well, something like you're going to buy an automobile, so you're going to look at it a bit more carefully, perhaps. This awareness of reality is what helps you switch from the automatic mode to the deliberate, as it were. This is what I would say is what helps you move from one culture into another, or what helps you enrich your culture by adding this ability to look at things, look at things new. Artists do it, and actors do it, and other people. We should learn these things from them. Awareness of reality, we call it. Now, there are many other exercises, things one does, things which one could notice, which are more or less valuable, more or less interesting, and so on. We have a snag here, you know, sort of a catch-22 almost, that there is a point beyond which we can't teach this stuff abstractly. We can't say a person should do such a thing. We have to say you, you, and you could be doing this and might be able to profitably, and that's the difficulty. Well, we have the disadvantage of living in the mass world. Well, mass communications don't help us beyond a certain point. However, we're working on, on that one. It may seem tiresome, and because it's tiresome and annoying to have to learn something from somebody whom you don't like. I mean, after all, if you buy a car, the mechanic doesn't come with it, <laughs> or the man who built it, and you don't have to go and drive it at Willow Run or whatever it is. There, I do see the difficulty. But what is the alternative? All I can tell you is the alternative really is, until you've seen enough examples of it around you through do-it-yourself mysticism, enough examples of the result of this, I'll give you our little phrase about it, which is, and I translate, burglarious attempts on the house of knowledge will in the end only earn you a bite from the rats in its basement. And I'll give you another one, my slogan, which is, Always be careful to make a bad impression on undesirables.